Greetings. Today I want to talk on the subject of spiritual unity. You know, we might think that divisions and trouble within the body of Christ is something new, uh, especially now in this day and age with so many different types of, say, religions or whatever, but nothing new as we're going to see. It's always been the way, and we're gonna, the scripture actually talks quite a bit <coughs> about divisions and problems within the church. Actually, if you read First and Second Corinthians, that's pretty much all that those two epistles are about, is all the problems that took place within uh, the Corinthian church. And so it's nothing new. Just like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, but this is something that's very important. If you've been listening to any of my messages lately, you've heard me say that, you know, in perilous times, you know, whether it be national or personal, a lot of times, you know, when things, when life turns up the heat, we have a tendency to turn on each other, you know, and kind of get at each other's throats. And instead, we need to come together. That's what we need to do. And certainly in Paul's age, and, you know, when he was writing these epistles, and when we see a lot of these scriptures that we're going to read today, certainly they were in perilous times. Uh, anyone who believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was, uh, in danger of losing their life. There was much persecution in that day and age uh, for those who were turning away from the traditional Jewish ways to, to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that one that would come. And, uh, and so it, it was truly a perilous time for them. And Paul knew that if they were going to not only um, survive but thrive, you know, and continue uh, to to make, you know, to perpetuate the faith, you know, to keep it going on, to pass that faith along, uh, that they needed to stand together, band together, and that's what we want to take a look at today. And so, um, we're going to look at the subject of spiritual unity. Our text is in Ephesians chapter four, and I want to want to read verses four, or excuse me, verses one through six and just kind of get a context of what we're talking about. So let's go ahead and read our text here. Hang on, let me see if I can get the slide to click over. There we go. <clears throat> he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and that's where I get my title, that spiritual unity. You know, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He says, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. And so as I read that text, to me, that just speaks, cries out, screams, spiritual unity. That's what we need. <clears throat> Again, as I said, there's so many divisions in the body of Christ today, you know, and the one thing that should pull us together, that should bind us together, is our common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of different church and faiths and denominations because people like to worship differently, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The only thing that is that, that matters, the only thing that is important is that we know for sure that we are saved, that we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. A couple of things from this passage that I want to, you know, of course the key verse is that in, de in verse 4 there, is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. But he uses in the beginning, he says, that vocation wherewith you're called. And, and actually our King James Bible is the only Bible that uses that word vocation. And, and a couple of reasons, I think. One is to not be redundant. Because that word vocation literally means a calling. And so he says, the calling with you to your call. They'd be kind of, uh, you know, repeating yourself. And so I, I kind of think that perhaps that's why that they, they use vocation. When I think of that word vocation, I don't know about you, but I think, well, it's just my job. But actually, it's more than that. If you look up the definition of the word vocation, it is that job or that career that you are inclined towards, okay? And so something that you have you, almost like a predisposition that this is what you're going to be. You know, I would never be a brain surgeon or a doctor for that matter in any stretch of the imagination. I've actually passed out just having to give blood before. I don't, I don't do blood. And so my vocation would never be a doctor. I just, that's not me, you know, and we can go on and on with other things, but you know, God has called me to be a preacher. That's my vocation. I'm, I'm predisposed or inclined to to be a preacher. A lot of people would say, "Well, I can never do that." Standing in front of people and 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 having to talk and being a wordsmith. I heard a preacher say that one time that as preachers, that's what we are. We are wordsmiths, and we need to use our words to to get the message of, of Christ across. And it's true. And some people say, "Well, I can't," and that's fine. That's what he's saying. But that's our calling. That's what we are called to do. And and our calling then 
as he said, is to, 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 to be, and, and, and I wrote down the definition. I, I, I want you just to see this here in the Vines Dictionary. Uh, uh, this vocation is a calling. It is always used, that word, that Greek word, it's always used in the New Testament of that calling, the origin, nature, and destiny of which are heavenly. The idea of the invitation from God being implied. It is used especially of God's invitation to man to accept the benefits of salvation. And so again, this he, he, he tells us again that he wants us to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that calling, he says, walk worthy of that calling that you have been called, that vocation. And that calling is, is in Christ. God has called us to the cross to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, to know that we're saved and to, to have that thing settled. The Bible says in 1 John, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is a no-so salvation. That's what the Bible teaches us. And that is that thing that binds us together. That thing that keeps us together is our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so instead of looking for differences and problems and, and, and that sort of a thing, we should be looking towards that thing that binds us together, that keeps us together. And praise God uh, that, that we have that glue uh, that can keep the body of Christ together. As I said, this business of divisions within the church and within the body of Christ and even in the world, it's nothing new. It's been around for a long time. And, and let me give you a couple of for examples, if you will, one from the, old te one from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament. Uh, one comes in the book of Philippians. Now understand that when Paul was writing the book of Philippians, this is one of his prison epistles meaning that he was in prison while he wrote it. And so while in prison, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Philippi. And it, it's interesting that even in church, or excuse me, even in prison, while Paul is in prison, he got word, he got news of a problem within that body of Christ. There was two ladies that had a disagreement. And so it must have caused enough of an uproar within the church uh, that people were talking about it and it was causing a problem. There was division and disunity uh, within the body of Christ. And so in Philippians 4, 2, Paul writes, he says, I, and he names the two ladies. He calls them out. And he says, I beseech you, Yodius, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Okay, and so he's not siding one with the other, saying you have to do this, do that, whatever. That's not what he's doing. But he says, be in the same mind in the Lord. Again, there's that common ground that we have in Christ, our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's encouraging them, you know, to put this difference aside. You know, it had gotten so bad. <clears throat> and we don't know what the division is. We have no idea what the problem was. And there's not, I read a lot of commentaries and nobody even uh, took a stab at what it could have been. Because we just don't know. Human nature is, you know, our human nature. It's like, oh, I wonder what it was. I wonder what they said or what was done. And <laughs> we want to know. You know, that's not important. That's not the issue. You know, sadly, that's what we look for. And that's the way, you know, really our culture in this world are always looking for trouble and problems. And, and you know, you got to have that, mm, th th that friction between. And, that, and that's sad that it has to be that way. And so Paul writes to them there at Philippi. And he says, you know, be in the same mind in the Lord. Barry, th put this thing behind you so that the body of Christ can continue to grow and thrive in the Lord Jesus Christ. The next example, again, a very familiar story, actually, of one uh, of Joseph. Now, you know that um, Jacob had his 12 sons. Joseph was the youngest at the time. <laughs> Benjamin came a little bit later, uh, but Joseph was the youngest, and he had his dream. He had his coat of many colors, and he had his dream. He had a vision that his brothers would bow down to him. And so his brothers, they didn't like him too much, uh, so much so that they actually conspired to kill him. Uh, but Reuben stepped in and said, no, we shouldn't kill him. And instead, they sold him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. And, and then in the long run, of course, you know that he, his brothers did bow down to him. Joseph became a leader uh, within Egypt and, and a ruler there. And his brothers had to come. And at the time, they didn't know it was him. But Joseph knew that, it, that, that that they were his brothers when they came because of the famine that was in the land. They were looking for food and, and, and provisions for their family or unless they die. And so Jacob had sent them. And so they go, and, and after all, everything had settled, and Joseph revealed himself to them and, and had wanted them you know, to bring word to Jacob, their father, that he was still alive. And so in Genesis 55, verse 24, he says, Joseph sent his brethren away, and they departed. And this was his parting words. He says, and he said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. And so I told him, he says, listen, guys, let's not fight on the way, okay? We're finally getting this thing past us, you know, behind us, and we're getting beyond this. You know, don't start fighting over something else. And so he had to give a warning to his brothers that they didn't uh, fight again over this matter. 
you know and and so you know there's a whole lot more to that story but again a couple of examples of divisions that you know one within the body of Christ there in Philippi one within the family of God and really that that the, the father's house was the precursor to our, our churches I suppose in some ways not completely but in some ways it was the precursor to our modern church but the father's house that patriarchal system uh, that the Jews had <laughs> and so we see these examples of division. As I said, it's not new. It's always been around and it always will be around because of human nature, because of sin, because the devil is always poking at us and stuff and trying to cause division. That's what he wants us to do. And so that's why Paul and other scriptures encourages us, again, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's something that you and I need to do. Now, understand that um, this unity, it, it's encouraged but nowhere in the Bible do I really see that it is outright commanded. Okay, in any of the scriptures that, that I've given or that we're going to read, uh, nowhere does it come right out and say that we have to do this. Okay, and I guess the reason that I, I believe that it's like that is because, you know, scripture's not asking us to be a doormat you know where we just lay down for the for the sake of peace and and you know and and lay aside our principles our biblical principles and what is moral and what is right you know we never should go against the truths of God's Word if anyone ever asks us to do something that is contrary to the Word of God then that's beyond this scope of, of spiritual unity okay uh, but we see a couple passages of Scripture again one New Testament one Old Testament where the idea of spiritual unity is encouraged again in Philippi Paul in, in, in the second chapter of Philippians he says fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded having the same love being of one accord and of one mind and so he's, he says you know this is going to bring him joy if the body of Christ can come together in the mind of Christ not siding again with one person over another but everybody coming together in Christ and doing you know the will of God together striving together to fulfill God's will God's purpose and God's plan personally and then as a body as, as well okay but he says this will bring him great joy and it brings the body of Christ great joy it brings us joy you know that when we learn to, to cooperate and to get along uh, one with another and so we need to learn to fulfill uh, his joy again not something commanded but again encouraged strongly encouraged you know I'll never forget the words of and it's probably not new with her, but it's the first time I had heard it. But uh, Velda Cook, who had been a long member, long standing member at our church, you know, one of the phrases that she said to me one time, and it just has always stuck with me, is that we can disagree without being disagreeable. And I guess that's kind of why this is encouraged and not so much commanded. In the uh, Old Testament, David, he writes in Psalm 133, he says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So it is a good thing uh, for us to learn to dwell together in unity. And so, again, it's a strong encouragement. <laughs> you know, it, it's not just a you know, ever so slight uh, suggestion. No, this is we're strongly encouraged to get together in the Lord within the body of Christ. And this holds true within the family unit as well. As I said, Joseph and, and his brothers, that's a family unit, that patriarchal system, my father's house, and how important it was for that family to be together. It's important for us and our families to, to, to learn to dwell together, but also within the body of Christ. And so this is, it's, it's, it's important, it's strongly important, greatly important, <clears throat> but nothing ever to go to where it would cause us to go against the truths of God's word. That's not what we're supposed to do. Just a couple of passages, three passages I want to share here uh, that shows us different angles on this, if you will, different perspective of this spiritual unity. Number the, the first one we find in Romans chapter 12 verses 16 through 21 we need to learn to overcome evil with good you know uh, the Bible talks about you know you know to turn the other cheek you know that kind of a thing go the extra mile that's the kind of thing we're talking about so in Romans here it says be of the same mind one towards another mind not high things in other words not don't be proud but condescend to men of low estate be not wise in your own conceits and he says recompense to no man evil for evil 
provide things honest in the sight of all men. And I like this phrase. He says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And so again, there's that encouraged but not commanded type thing. You know, as much as, as, as you can, as much as you possibly can, because there are going to be times with, that we have to stand up and disagree if something is wrong and goes against the truths of God's word. But by and large, we should learn to, to get together in Christ. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And so he says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so that's the key there to me in that verse and talking in, in spiritual unity. You know, a lot of times when things go wrong and we feel like we have been wronged or there's been an injustice, you know, maybe not to ourselves personally, but in the world or in our community or in our home or something like that, we feel like, well, I got to stand up and do something. Okay. And, you know, I'm not going to say unequivocally that no, you don't. Maybe God is calling you and using you as an instrument, but by and large, that's what he's saying. That's what Paul is saying back there in, in, in Romans. He says, listen, he says, vengeance is mine. Let God take care of it. God can deal with division way better than, than we can. Number one, he knows all the sides of the story. He knows all the circumstances, everything that goes into this. You know, I guarantee you that, you know, if we go into it, we're going to be prejudiced in some way. We're going to side with one side or the other. You know, and, and so we need to be very careful about this thing. And so he says, let, leave vengeance to God. He, he's got it. He's got a handle on it. And I, I try to live that way. The Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. It's not my place to judge other people and, and, and to go after them and to seek vengeance, even when I feel like they've harmed me or wronged me. I'm just supposed to do right. I'm supposed to do good. And that's why he says, I need to overcome evil with good and do good. And so he says, if your enemy hunger, feed, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. All right. Vengeance belongs to God. And that's if we would get that in our mind, if people would get that in their minds, you know, that let God deal with the injustices, the wrongs and stuff. God is a righteous God who will judge righteously. Let him do the judging. Let him do the vengeance. That's his part. That's his gig. You know, you just do right. You do you. And you do right. Do it the very best that you possibly can. Don't worry about so much other things. You know, that's that's not our concern. That's not what we should be focusing upon in our own lives and our own hearts and that sort of a thing. And so allow God to do it. I, that's what I like about that, that, you know, where he talks there about, you know, getting together. And he says, as much as lieth within you. You know, I realize sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have to stand up for what we believe in. And that's just going to come. I get that, okay? But don't allow it to become the norm, if you will. We're always so contrary to everyone and everything around us, okay? So that's the first thing. We need to overcome evil with good. The second thing, and we find this passage in 1 Corinthians, and as I said, there was a lot of problems within that Corinthian church, and that's First and 2 Corinthians, two very long books of the Bible dealing with all the problems that they had. And division was one of those problems. And we see in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right in the get-go, verses 10 through 13, the Bible says this. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And again, that's the mind of Christ, the mind of God. Not this person, that person, this way, that way, this belief, that belief, this religion, that religion. No, in the mind of Christ, being perfectly joined together. He says, For it hath been declared unto me, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. And again, divisions within the church. And he says, Now this I say, that every one of you say, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. And so what was happening was, is that the, 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 the members there, the people there, were um, following a man. You know, as long as I've been in the ministry, I've preached against this sort of thing. You know, folks, I don't want people within my church to follow me, okay? You know, it's kind of more like follow me as I follow Christ. But it, in reality, you know, if the good Lord 
um, should call me elsewhere. If he should call me to another ministry, or God forbid, you know, he should call me on home, although I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be offered, as Paul said. But, you know, if something like that should happen, another pastor should be able to just step right in there and continue on with the ministry and to go forth, you know. But reality is, is that so many times we follow a person. We follow a man. And that's not the way that it should be. You know, I've in my 30 plus years of ministry, I've known preachers and churches and ministries that, you know, that, oh, we do ministry this way, according to this book, according to this preacher, according to this man. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. And we see it here, uh, even within our scriptures that we're reading right here, you know, that even in that early church, some were saying, well, I'm a Paul, I am Paulus, I'm Peter, I'm a Christ. And, and so he asks the question as well. He says, is Christ divided? And the simple answer is no, he's not. He says, was Paul crucified uh, for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. And so, listen, I'll tell you this. All division is man-made. It is truly man-made. You know, when we see all these different faiths and denominations and all these different uh, sects going off here and there and stuff like that, um, that's not a good thing. It truly isn't. Those are man-made divisions. Even in the days of Christ, when Jesus was walking the face of the earth, there's, and I should have looked this up before I started preaching, but I don't remember the exact text or something like that. But anyway, in the days of Christ, Paul, Jesus had his disciples and they were following him. Not Paul, but Jesus had his disciples and he were in as he was walking and teaching and stuff. And the disciples came to him and said, hey, there's this group over here that are preaching in your name, but, you know, we forbid them. And what did Jesus say? He says, no. He says, if they're not against me, he, or no, this is what he said. He says, if they're for me, don't you be against them. And so he told him, he said, leave them be. They're preaching Christ. You know, they're preaching the coming kingdom. They're preaching Messiah. And so even though they weren't walking with Jesus and stuff, uh, there again, there was all that, already that division. And so Christ is not divided, my friends. You know, I don't care what... Uh, you know, what's the, the children's Sunday school song that, that we would sing? You know, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. You know, God doesn't belong to any one faith, any one denomination, any one creed, any one color of skin, any one country, any one nation, any one nationality, any one language. God, Christ belongs to all. This is all his kingdom. This is all his world. And we are to serve him as Christ. Okay, as Messiah, as Lord. And God is as Jehovah God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of this world that we live in today. And so is we answer the question, is Christ divided? No. But we cause those divisions, and those are never a good thing. That's what this that's what Satan likes to do. He likes to get in and cause those divisions. It's never a good thing. Uh, when you see church splits and when you see, you know, different people going off and starting this way of believing and that way of believing and stuff. And so we need to be very careful of this sort of thing. Uh, spiritual unity is so very important, you know, and especially, again, let's, let's, I got one point left and then I'll be done here, but let's, let's go, let's circle back. Let's go back to where we started. Okay. Understand is that when, when these scriptures were being written, when Paul was writing these scriptures and when he was encouraging spiritual unity within the body of Christ, there was much persecution within the body of Christ at that time. Okay. Anybody who had believed on Jesus as Messiah, the promised Messiah that would come, okay, they were ostracized from the, the temple, from the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion. And as such, they, they couldn't worship in the temple. They couldn't, they couldn't even conduct business. People wouldn't conduct business with them, okay? And many of them were starving and, and not having an income to provide for their family. And so the church had to come alongside and, and help those who, who couldn't help themselves. It was a perilous time, more than what we face today. You know, we think these are perilous days. No, that was rough. You know, and, and certainly if 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 think if we keep on the same course that we are now, it's only going to get worse here in this world that we live today where people will more and more turn away from God and turn to really the ways of the devil in this world, that deception that he has, has put out there. And so you and I as believers in Christ, you know, we need to heed this warning from the Bible, from God, from the Apostle Paul and all these epistles and letters that we're reading, again, is that we need this spiritual unity now more than ever within the body of Christ. Instead of looking for differences in people, let's come together in that one mind. Again, there's one faith, one baptism, one God, you know, all those things that he said there. It's all one. That's what it's all about. We all started in God when God said, let there be light. Hmm? And then he created the heavens and the earth and he put man and he put woman and he built this world. 
and and such and then it, the tower of babel of course that's when he had to d divide people and such but anyway divisions are man-made they truly are you know and and you know why did god divide them at the tower of babel because they left god out they thought they could be as good as god just like satan had done thought he could be as good as god and so god confused the languages to disperse the people and so that they would turn back to him and so my friends today a lot of times when perilous times come whether it was in the days of paul in the days of Christ, or if it's today, these perilous times, instead of allowing it to cause division, let it bring us together at the foot of the cross. Amen? That's what we need to do. Now, as I said, I had one more point. Let's, let's go with this. And this is, we talk about being a good salty. <laughs> what do you mean a good salty? Okay, well, follow me. Mark 9.50 says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? He says, have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. And I like the way Mark words that verse there, okay? We are to be salty, but a good kind of salty. In other words, be salty in here. Make sure that you are the salt of the earth in here, but out here in the world, have peace one with another. In the uh, commentary critical and explan explanatory on the whole Bible, this is what he said. He says, see to it that you retain in yourselves those precious qualities that make you a blessing to one another and to all around you. And so salt is good. You know, if you've ever tasted something that doesn't have salt, and I, you know, anybody who has high blood pressure or whatever is supposed to watch their salt intake i suppose all of us should but if you've ever had something that's not salty you know it's like you, you, you go to take a bite of your green beans and you're like oh where's the salt you know it doesn't taste good or, or french fries you know with no salt on them it's like her you know it's like that just doesn't taste so good <laughs> one of the jokes in our family is you know my wife she'll cook something or whatever and she'll be making something and so she'll bring me a little bit to taste and she'll be like Brian how's this taste and so I'll taste it and and, I, and I, what I used to say all the time every time as soon as I would taste it I'd be like, oh need salt you know whether it did or didn't it didn't matter I told her it did just as a joke and she got that she understood that and she'd just look at me and I'm like no it tastes good or whatever I would tell her it tastes and stuff like that so then one time though she she was going to cure me of this and so she brought me I don't even remember what it was maybe some a taste of chili or whatever uh, but she was here Brian taste this what do you think and so so I tasted it, and uh, as soon as I did, you could tell she must have took like a teaspoon of, of salt and just in this little taste and just put a teaspoon of salt in and stirred it in. And I'm like, oh, oh. and she asked, "Does it need salt?" I'm like, no, "Oh my goodness!" And she got the joke on me that time. And so you could see, you can you could be too salty. You can have too much salt. And it's not a good thing. You got to have that right balance of salt. It's got to be there to enhance the flavor, but don't overcome. And sometimes you and I as believers in Christ, we've gotten too salty. We truly have. And we've become offensive. And we push pay people away from God and away from the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be just enough. If you get the salt just right, then it causes people to be thirsty. And then they want to come to that fountain. They want to come to Jesus who is that living water that can satisfy that craving on their mouth, on their lips, if you will. And so we need to be a good salty. That's what I'm trying to say. And so, again, it all goes back whether you say, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably amongst all men, okay? Uh, but endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Spiritual unity. This is something that is it's important. It is truly important. You know, we see so many churches going by the wayside. We see so many people dropping away from the body of Christ because of all the divisions within the body of Christ. And it's not the way that God wants it to be. And so, my friends, let's come together in Jesus. Let's come together in Christ, having that mind of Christ, that mind of God that is outlined for us within the Scriptures. You know, if you know anything about me at all, you know that my preaching is to, is to teach people the truths of God's Word, to know Him, to know God, and to know Him better, to know those Scriptures. That is our common ground. That's where we meet. And that, to me, is the most important thing that we have, that we can have, the blessings that, that God can bestow upon us. Amen? So hopefully you understand where I'm coming from today. You know, we do need to have spiritual unity. But as I says, not to the point where we become a doormat, but and not to the point where we become too salty. You know, those are two extremes, I think. You know, the doormat is on one side, too salty is on the other side. We need to find that ground in the middle where we are a good salty, where we have that good unity, where we're working together, striving for the cause of Christ, and causing people to want to come to know the Jesus that's in our hearts and lives. 
I pray the Lord will bless you with this. And, and again, if you're listening to this and you're not sure of your salvation, reach out to me. You know, you can get a hold of me through Facebook, uh, through the church's website, uh, and, and even through this YouTube video, this channel. You can reach out to me. And I'd love to speak to you about the matter, matter of your salvation. If you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to get that thing taken care of. That's the most important thing. Okay, that is the greatest blessing of that calling uh, that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless, and uh, we'll see you again next week.